Good morning. Welcome to St. Thomas Episcopal Church. And as always, a welcome to those who are joining us online. We are delighted to have you with us and feel your presence. I invite you to please stand as we rise together to sing our opening hymn found in the blue hymnal, hymn number 488, Be Thou My Vision. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. God of wisdom and love, in whom we find our joy. Help us to listen for your word and to discern your way forward for our church. Give us the insight to hold on to what is true, the courage to explore new ideas, and the boldness to create with you. Let us be shaped by faith for your mission through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, beginning with the first verse. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if, my, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that you may pass, uh, pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened to the tent of, to Sarah and, and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk to the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate, they said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season. And your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. The word of the Lord. The psalm for, for, for today is found in your bulletin, which is Psalm 15. And we will read it responsibly while breaking at the asterisk. Lord who may dwell in your tabernacle. Who may abide upon your holy hill. Whoever leads a blameless life and does what is right. Who speaks the truth from his heart. There is no guile upon his tongue. He does no evil to his friend. He does not keep contempt upon his neighbors. In his sight, the wicked is rejected. He has sworn to do no wrong. And does not take back his word. He does not have he does not give his money in hope of gain. Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things. The second reading is taken from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 28. Christ Jesus it is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. 
he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, so provided that you continually so securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to, ma to make, no, make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory and of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory in his he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Luke. As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the gospel of our Lord. I speak to you in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is a joy to be back together with you again after yet more church travel, this time for the Episcopal General Convention. I had the privilege of joining a deputation of delegates that were elected by our diocese to join in the work of the larger church. This typically happens every three years, but it had been postponed because of COVID. And there were many questions about how this was going to work. In previous general conventions, it typically ran at least eight days. And if you were on a committee, sometimes you might have been there for 10 or 12 days, actually. This convention was shortened to just four days of legislative business. We had to fit it all in. And so we started each day at 8.30 in the morning, usually with Eucharist or morning prayer. And then we ended most days around 9.30 in the evening. We did take time for lunch and dinner, but there was really substantial work that we needed to get done, including the election of new leaders for the House of Deputies. So when convention gathers, we have two bodies, this thing called the House of Bishops, which is comprised of bishops and then deputies, the clergy and laity. And so we, it was time to elect a new president for the House of Deputies. We elected Julia Ayala Harris, a Latina woman to serve as president and uh, Rachel Tabor Hamilton, a priest who is from Shakin First Nation heritage. And so it's the first time that two people of color are serving together as leaders of our church in this way. We also discussed and passed an incredible mind-boggling number of resolutions to work on important issues like creation care, liturgical expression, and of course, social justice issues. We voted to dedicate $2 million to work on measures to aid in dismantling racism and there were about, it's 100 bishops who were present and 1,200 clergy and lay leaders representing dioceses from across our church. And this was a smaller than usual gathering. It really was, it was my first time going and it was an absolutely extraordinary experience. I found myself genuinely moved and hopeful about the work of the church and those who love it so very much. At the same time though, um, for those of us who were newcomers, we picked up on this sense of lament from those who had done this before that it wasn't the same. Just, it wasn't as long and it wasn't done the same as it had been before. For example, typically the bishops and house of deputies worship together every day. We weren't able to do that. You know, and most of the focus of the time together, although we did pause regularly for prayer and the chaplain was amazing, if you have a chance, a lot of this is posted online, go check it out. But most of what we did was the work of the church. And because the time together was shorter than previously before, there was this palpable tension in the air about really 
understanding that there was a need and a, a desire and a want to get stuff done. There was a lot that had been postponed that needed to get done, stuff related to budget. But in the midst of that, we also wanted to create some real space to be able to thoughtfully engage it, to be able to prayerfully discern. And so there was this tension every day with each of these resolutions of, okay, how long can we realistically spend contemplating this, debating this, because there's so much more we have to get done. And this tension, I think, is only heightened by the sense of the urgency of the time that we're living in. So I think we're entering what feels like a new phase of the pandemic, one of increasing hope, that we're making progress, and we're starting to live into something that maybe is gonna start to become a little bit more normal, hoping. And so like every other institution, the church, and I found this to be true when gathered with the large church for general convention, is trying to figure out what's it gonna mean for us to move forward in this new way. And what does it mean for us when we're trying to follow Jesus? And there's a little bit of anxiety in the room at times about this, right? Should we stick to the tried and true paths that have worked before? Or do we venture forward in maybe new and less certain ways? And underneath it all, there seems to be this pervasive worry. Is the church going to make it? Is the church going to be okay? What's it going to look like moving forward? There is understandable concern that what does it mean that most, if not many churches certainly, are still working hard at just getting people back into the rhythms of worship and community and formation. We're still kind of getting back into it again. The way that many of us remember church back in the day is not the way it is now necessarily, and maybe it's not going to be. We're navigating a new course across terrain that's unlike anything we've experienced before. And if there's one thing that most of us dislike, especially Episcopalians, it is change, right? So you want to know one of the things that got people most fired up about at general convention? Do I have like any church nerds who could give a guess on this? What do you think got people the most worked up about? Hint, it's in your pews. Yes, thank you, Todd, that's exactly right. Oh my goodness, the resolution to explore liturgical change. We weren't voting <laughs> on any liturgical change, not really. The resolution to just explore liturgical changes to our prayer book, which by the way, is as old as your rector. Um, that was a really hot issue. We spent an entire afternoon debating the language of whether or not we should even have a committee to explore the possibility of maybe changing some of the language of our prayer book. Oh my gosh, we don't like change. And you know, to be fair, some things are just that good, and maybe things like prayer books stand the test of time. And to be really fair, I honor the spirit of prayerful discernment that we need to take time before we make changes to something as important as a prayer book. But I do think there's a deeper issue at hand, that there's a spiritual issue, that when we have that sometimes knee-jerk reaction to change, that feeling in the gut that maybe feels like anxiety, I think it represents a deeper issue, one that is spiritual, about our ability to sit with tension or not, our ability to stay present to God or not. And this is beautifully and perfectly explored today in both our Old Testament and our Gospel lesson, which provide a kind of interesting perspective to each other and almost a counterpoint in conversation. So the first story that we heard, which was beautifully read by Travis, is commonly known as the hospitality of Abraham. There are icons depicting this. It's, it's a pretty big story in Scripture. So Abraham is about his business, and these three strangers show up. And he doesn't know who they are, but he offers them hospitality, refreshment, not knowing that in doing so, he was actually being present and attentive to God in his midst. And although commentators typically and rightly applaud Abraham for his hospitality, I think 
you know, there are some other things that we might pay attention to as we explore this story in a deeper way. And the first one is that we overlook the fact that Abraham was doing what Abraham was supposed to do. Offering hospitality was more than just a kind of cool custom. And the, I mean, it, it was actually in the context of these ancient desert communities, a matter of life and death. Travelers depended upon the hospitality of strangers in order to survive. To refuse hospitality would have been more than a breach of conduct. It would have been a gross offense and violation. Abraham provided hospitality because hospitality was required. He wasn't necessarily going above and beyond here, although he did get the fatted calf and all that good stuff. Um, and I think there's a really interesting lesson in this, that sometimes when we do the daily and the necessary right things of life, that God shows up in our midst without us even knowing it. Sometimes God shows up on mountaintops and in burning bushes, but you know, sometimes it's in the everyday stuff of life when we're doing the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. And I also think the second thing is that it's worth wondering about the other people in this story, the people who participate in the hospitality that is offered. It's called the hospitality of Abraham, but there were other people in the story, right? There was Sarah, certainly, but there were also the unnamed servants who go and help prepare this meal and who therefore are co-participants with Abraham in offering hospitality. They didn't, it wasn't their decision necessarily, but it was very much the fruit of their labor. And so it invites this really interesting question about who are the people who support us when we are doing the right thing, when we are being fully present to God in our midst? Do we do enough to thank them, to acknowledge their ministry and their support? So I would not have been able to go to general convention if Bradley had not been on dad duty, much less priest duty by being willing to come in and do supply in my absence, um, to supply with all of you. And this was on his day off from hope. And he loves being with you, but it's still, it was a gift. I'm not gonna start calling myself Father Abraham here, but you know, I'm grateful deeply for the times in my life when people have offered support, sometimes behind the scenes. And I think it's worth asking, as the body of Christ, who are those people in our midst? Who are the people quietly showing up and supporting the work of the church? Who are the people who are in our kitchen so that we can have coffee hour? Who are the people mowing the lawn? Who are the people counting money? Who are the people giving rides to our homebound parishioners because they need to get to a medical appointment? This particular story invites for me the question of what does it take, but also who does it take to be fully present to God? What are the ways that we can support one another in doing the right thing, whatever that right thing is, so that we can collectively, as one body, turn our attention to the divine, even if we don't realize at the time that's what we're doing? So that's the first story. The gospel lesson. This is a singer, and it offers a different set of questions. This particular story is one that I have struggled with over the years especially as my family has grown and I have spent no small amount of time in the kitchen doing all the kinds of things and so is Bradley that are required to run a household. I mean, there are a few things that can feel more frustrating than when you are working hard, you're cooking, you're cleaning, you're doing all the stuff and it feels like nobody around you is paying attention. I've been there. So we hosted Easter um, for our family years ago, it was the first year of my call with all of you, and Elizabeth Grace was still very little at the time. She was still waking up in the middle of the night. It was our first Holy Week together, and we were having the extended family over, and it was the first time at our house, and I got this bee in my bonnet that it was gonna be the best, biggest, most amazing Easter meal that had ever been served, and like, 
we were ironing the linens. I mean, when I say this is ridiculous, let me paint the picture. We were polishing like whatever, like silverware we had. We took out the fancy stuff, the china. Like we were cooking all week. We even set up outside tables where we put all this stuff and I did flower arrangements. It was over the top. It was too much, plus Holy Week. So by the time I got to that Easter meal with my family, and they had no idea. They were like, oh, this is wonderful. But, you know, this, this beautiful meal. I was so tired. And by pure chance and miscommunication, I went into the kitchen to start washing all the dishes. And my parents and family took the children outside to do the Easter egg hunt. And they didn't realize I was there. And so I'm inside the kitchen, like washing dishes, like, where is everybody? waiting for the Easter egg hunt, I go outside and it's already happened and nobody took any pictures. I was just like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. I just went through Holy Week and hospitality and I missed the Easter egg hunt. I was, it was such a Martha moment and I did it to myself. I did it to myself. I think we've all had moments like this though, right? Sometimes it's in the kitchen, but sometimes maybe it's, it's in the communities we live in, the places that we work. We have these moments where maybe we, we don't feel seen, we don't feel supported, and we're raising our hands saying, hey, will somebody please come and help me? And that is what makes this story so hard for me. Because Jesus doesn't buy it. Jesus doesn't buy it. He pushes back. He challenges the assumption that others should join us in doing all the stuff, in being distracted, in going from one thing to the next, unable to be fully present to others, much less to self or God. Jesus wasn't criticizing Martha for doing stuff, for her act of hospitality. He was questioning her state of being. He was questioning her heart, her sense of of inner peace. It is not our doing that God wants first. It's our being. It's our relationship. It's our presence. Our doing, our ministry, it flows first from the peace that comes from knowing and being in relationship with God. It doesn't work the other way around. I can't help but wonder, so what would have happened if Martha had let go of some of the work and the stuff she had placed upon herself? You know, maybe they could have just had bread and wine. Or would somebody else, a family member or a disciple, you know, there's a story about bread and, and fish multiplying. I mean, somebody would have figured something out, right? I do not think that Jesus was rebuking her here. I actually think he was offering a gentle invitation for her to be fully present, to cultivate genuine inner peace, to let go of some of the burdens that we sometimes place upon ourselves so that we can be attentive to what really does matter. And you know, the interesting thing about this, I found this true in my own life, is that when I challenge those assumptions and I let go of some of that stuff, it gives permission for other people to do the same thing too. This is not a story about some false choice between contemplation or action. I think it's just a story about making room for God in our lives, whatever we're doing. And that always, always requires that we put God first, that we let go of other stuff. Martha wanted to invite Jesus into the routine of her life, right? As she knew it, Martha wanted to love Jesus in a way that felt comfortable to her by carrying on and preserving traditions that for her were the right way. But Jesus questions that and invites her into a new way, a way of inner peace, not focused on working harder or doing more, but rather seeking God. It's not necessarily what we're doing that's at stake here. It's why we're doing it, who we're doing it for. Sometimes washing dishes is a perfectly beautiful way to pray. I've done it many times. But sometimes it's just a grouchy way to live into a self-imposed martyrdom. There's a difference between being and doing. The things we do matter, but they should always flow, first and foremost, from being, from the relationship that we have with God. So what's that look like? It could mean spending a few minutes alone each day in contemplative prayer and quiet. If you're not doing that, 
recommend it. It might mean saying the daily office. Maybe it means joining others in prayer and the study of God's word. Maybe it means listening to sacred music or going for a walk to soak up the beauty of creation. But it does require that we always self-check and we ask ourselves that question, am I spending time with God? And if I'm not, what do I need to do to add that in? Not because we're supposed to, although we are, but really because it's a gift. It's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing to spend time with God. Jesus calls it living water for a reason. So if you are finding yourselves challenged by these difficult um, days, all the stuff going on that, that we're living in, you know, if you need refreshment, this is a time in summer where we kind of go on vacation, maybe you could also give yourself permission to just stop to put away all the other stuff, however important it seems, so that you can spend time with God. Go for a walk, go fishing, listen to music, pray, meditate, whatever that is for you that brings you a sense of peace and refreshment. You know, I've said it before, I'll probably say it again many times, I have never once heard anybody on their deathbed say they wish they had spent more time working or doing or filling up their time with all the stuff it's love. It's always love. It's family, and it's also God. People think a lot about God on their deathbed. God thinks a lot about us. God wants us to be whole. God wants us to have peace. So I would leave you with one final thought for your consideration. So earlier this week, we had these beautiful images that were released from the new James Webb Telescope. Amazing. Literally breathtaking. Like many of you, I'm sure, I found myself spellbound, just captivated, lost in this kind of existential and theological wonder. Our universe is vast beyond our comprehension. And yet, as followers of Jesus, we believe that the God who created all of that, the universe, calls us into relationship, into love. That which is divine, infinite, beyond our scope of understanding, meets us where we are for the purpose of love. And so to put this in the plainest way possible, I think, these stories today aren't about Abraham's hospitality or Martha's hospitality. I think it's about God's hospitality. I think it's about God's invitation to us. God is always setting a table of love before us. The real question is, will we sit? Will we join God? Will we say yes? Amen. Let us now stand together as we proclaim our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
It is our custom to share together in the reading of the prayers of the people. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For all who serve God and his church. For the special needs and the concerns of this congregation, including Ken, Kim, Bethel, Missy, Malcolm, George, Brian, Jeff, Lachlan, Sarah, Jeff, Diane, Chris, Rose, Chris, Carol, Justin, Frank, Scott, Brian, Caroline, Max, Dorothea, Phyllis, Vicki, Susan, Linda, Emily, Loretta, Rudy, Ray, Juliana, Major, Shirley, Jim, Mimi, Mary, Susan, Eva, Abigail, Betty, Charles, Christine, Marilyn, Tatiana, Alexandra, Alexandra, Maria, and Thea. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins for our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Do you remember when the piece used to take like 15 minutes? <laughs> I never thought I'd miss it, but I kind of do. <laughs> We're still getting back there. Um, I invite you to be seated. We've got just a couple of things to share for you. Um, first one, super exciting. Um, there is a humanity a Habit for Humanity mission trip to the Northern Tier that's happening. Um, Wayne and Marion Martinez are coming from St. Thomas. Is there anybody else from St. Thomas that I don't know who's going? All right, this is a really wonderful thing. That's an area that's really been um, 
impacted in many ways by population decline and just a lack of resources in general. So this wonderful group um, representing people from different parishes in our convocation is going up to do some much needed help with Habit to um, Humanity. So it's going to be really good stuff. So please pray for um, Wayne and Marion and their time away. We have two um, fellowship opportunities coming up. The Ken Moyer Dining Club is up and running again. That's wonderful. That's this week for the gentlemen amongst us, um, July 19th, 5.30 at Scooters. Then the women are going to meet also at Scooters um, on the third Wednesday um, of the month. And yes. Okay, fantastic. So um, for those who are online, if you're planning to join us for the Women's Fellowship at Scooters, please just make sure you sign up because they'd like to have a count of how many to expect. You can call the office or there's a sign-up sheet um, in the Northex. Thank you. Um, Maria, do you want to say anything about this amazing concert world premiere of uh, Gary Davis's poetry, which is going to be like uh, sure. amazing? I've heard about this already. Um, so um, I, w I know that Gary has been writing poetry his whole life. He's here. And um, so uh, I was really excited about the idea of writing some pieces for this singer, wonderful, wonderful singer, who I encountered and who wanted to do a concert with me. It seemed like a perfect match of this incredible baritone voice and these wonderful poems that um, are about Gary's spiritual journey. I call uh, the cycle of the pilgrim after one of the poems. And it's sort of a journey from depression to feeling just the love of God and how it has um, carried him along. So I do hope that you will come. I, I, it's not going to be live streamed this time um, because I really want you to be here. So um, please do. It's, it's a free will offering. And there will also be um, uh, Brahms' Four Series Songs, which is a masterpiece from the, his last year of life. And some other music by James and um, by Robert Owens, who is a composer you may not have heard of. But... He's also a very wonderful composer, so please come. It's on Saturday the 30th at 4 p.m. By the way, this is just a great thing to invite friends and neighbors to come to as well. Got to put a plug in for evangelism. Uh, Maria's had an amazing um, number of offerings for us this year, so I thank you for that and really do commend that as a way to invite people to experience our sanctuary and this extraordinary musical talent that we're so gifted to have. So please, please, please come to that. Um, I will not be here next um, Sunday, but I'm very pleased to say that the Reverend David Bateman will be coming back. You may remember him from last summer. He's just fantastic, great preacher, really nice um, guy. So uh, the kids and I and Bradley are going to Williamsburg, Virginia for a week. We're gonna do like a history thing with them. Um, but in my absence, David will be here, and um, I commend, you know, please please be here to, to enjoy that. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful service. Any other things to share for the benefit of community? Then walk in peace.
us with the light of day. All things come of you, O Lord, and have I known, have we given thee. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is right, and it's a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, and to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and the blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God, and they are for the people.
partners join together in our prayer of commissioning and sending. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who journey with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit remain with you now and always. in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia.